Hello, we're going to be in Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, through Malachi 3.12. For, remember, I, we talked about that Malachi is using a special form of dialogue, question and answer. In Paul, we call it a diatribe in Romans. It's the basic form of Socrates and became the basic form of the rabbis as codified in the Babylonian and, Tal and Palestinian Talmuds. What it is is to ask a question and then to have a response. Now, the reason that Malachi uses it is that probably the people in his day were not willing to admit that they really felt this way, but they did. And they were kind of talking to each other or thinking back in the back of their mind. They weren't saying it outwardly to God, but they were thinking it. Now, the question in verse 17 is answered in chapter 3. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? In that you, everyone who does evil, is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Now, basically, this is the same old question that we have found in Psalm 73, the book of Job, uh, Jeremiah 12, 1 through 4, Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4. Why are the wicked prospering and the righteous seeming to languish? Uh, why do those who do evil seem to get ahead? And those of us who are trying so hard to the Lord's will, we get further and further behind. Well, that was the question. It's related in Malachi to the terrible discouragement that came upon the Jewish people in this Persian period. They had rebuilt the temple, but it was nothing like Solomon's temple. God's presence had lifted up and moved east with the exiles, but he had never returned in that marvelous supernatural manifestation to bless the second temple. And so it had become a wearisome existence. They were fighting with all the uh, little peoples around them, the little nations of Edom and Samaria. Things weren't going well with Persia. And God had not really manifested himself in this powerful way. And they were just saying, what good does it do to serve God? Where is a God of justice anyway? Here we're doing sacrifices. We're back in the temple ritual. And, and look at us. We're, we're pressed down. And it was a day of great discouragement. And that's what set this question up. Where is the God of justice? Okay, now chapter 3. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Now, my messenger is exactly the same as the word Malachi. Malachi means my messenger. Now, the word messenger in both Hebrew and in Greek can mean messenger or angel. Okay, so I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Now, from parts of Isaiah where this idea of clearing the way is also used, Isaiah 40, verse, um, can't read my writing, excuse me, verse 5, Isaiah 40, uh, 57, verse 14, and 62, 10. Talk about clearing the way. It's used for the Messiah, getting ready for the Messiah. When a royal visit was coming, they would clean the roads up and paint the houses, kind of like when the president comes to town. And that's what this messenger was to do. Get everybody ready, prepare the road. That's a physical metaphor, but it's used in a spiritual sense. Now, from the New Testament, it seems that John the Baptist fulfills this from the testimony of Jesus, although, although John the Baptist says, I'm not Elijah. Now, maybe in John 1, 20 through 23, when he says that, he's saying, I'm not Elijah physically reborn. Now, he looked like Elijah. He dressed just like him, acted just like him, a little strange, a little flaky in the way he dressed it, looked just like a prophet wearing those animal skins, living out in the desert. But he said, I'm not Elijah, and yet Jesus said that he was. Let me give you a, a few of these, if you would. Uh, Matthew 3, 3, Mark 1, 3, Luke 1, 76, and 3, 4, and then John 1, 23. Okay, Elijah. Uh, some of the early church expected Elijah to come back. Uh, so did the Septuagint, apparently. Some of the early church fathers. But apparently it was John the Baptist's ministry. Now, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, the word Lord here, if you'll notice, it's not all caps. The, little, the O is little, the R is little, the D is little. Therefore, this is not the covenant name for God. This is the word Adonai, okay? Now, here it is used of Yahweh, but in context of the New Testament, it's used of Jesus. Now, it is a common technique of the New Testament writers to take the Old Testament titles of God and apply them to Jesus, the idea of shepherd. Jesus the Good Shepherd, John 10. Uh, Jesus is Lord, and here's another example of that. Many like that to assert his full deity. Now, when it says he will uh, uh, come suddenly into his temple, uh, this is very interesting.
because the, in Jesus' day, the Jews were expecting the Messiah to come quickly and suddenly in the temple. Maybe that's why Jesus cleansed the temple twice to fulfill this prophecy. Before I leave this, two other places that this is where the word Lord is used for God in the Old Testament, the God the Father and God the Son, the New, is Joel 2.32, quoted in Romans 10.13. Okay? Now, now, you may have and the messenger of the covenant, but really, the word and in Hebrew, just like in Greek, can mean even or and. And I think it should be even, because I think we need with one person here, not two. And there's been much discussion about this messenger of the covenant. It's only used here in the whole Old Testament. The rabbis say it's the angel of the Lord because it's connected with the covenant uh, of Yahweh and his people. Uh, and I'm not sure, but I, I understand what they're saying there exactly. They think it's an angel. I think it's a messenger. I think John the Baptist fulfilled that. Now, notice where it says, uh, verse 2, Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Uh, for he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Now, here we're talking about judgment. And judgment has two aspects. To one, uh, like in verse 2, it is a day of purification and refining and cleaning, a day of reward. Uh, for those who know the Lord, the coming of the Lord is a great joy. Oh, but for those who don't know the Lord, the coming of the Lord is a great tragedy beyond words to describe. For one, it's eternal familiness, uh, eternal uh, joy and relationship. For other, it's separation and pain and and forever brokenness. Oh. Now, notice where it says here, who can stand when he appears? Now remember, this is a military term for standing one's ground. In the Old Testament, the standard is God himself. That's why all the word for sins are deviation from this standard, or measuring read, that we usually translate righteousness or just. God is the standard. That's why the Bible says you must be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. That's why the Bible can say for all of us that all of we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because that's the standard. That's why we need the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God took him who knew no sin and made him become sin that we might become the righteousness, the standard of God. See, we're taking the robes of righteousness of Jesus and applying them to us. And that's the idea here. Who can stand? Well, no one can stand except Jesus in his sinlessness. Now, this refiner's fire is a term from metallurgy. And, and the idea here is to burn off the dross. It's to test but not destroy. Now, the word fuller soap comes from vegetable lye. And it's the best they had, like our bleach, for making something as white as it can possibly be. Now, in verse 3, it talks about a smelter. There's another metaphor, the same ideal of judgment from, the, from metallurgy. Uh, Roman Catholic theology try to use verse 3 as a proof text for purgatory. But I think in context, it, it, it won't hold that. Now, when it mentions the sons of Levi, it's speaking of the priest. From chapter 1, verse 6 to chapter 2, verse 9, we have been dealing with the priest. And so they're brought back up. Look at verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Now the Jews kind of look back on their days of wilderness wanderings as the ideal time or the honeymoon between Yahweh and his people. And so it's kind of idealized like we would say the good old days. This is the good old days religiously speaking. Notice in verse 5. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. Now remember for some it's a judgment. Uh, for salvation, some it's judgment for joy. Now, I, I want to remind you that the, when we look in verse 5 at the different aspects of judgment, we need to remember that though there are some religious qualities and some social qualities, there is no distinction at all made between the religious and the social. Now, I, I get really tickled sometimes with the social gospel and, the, and the, uh, you know, the spiritual gospel. There's just one gospel, and the gospel affects all of man. Man religiously, man physically, affects his mind, his emotions, his will. It affects the rest of his life. It impacts all of us. So that which is spiritual is also that which is physical. And you can't talk about loving Jesus without helping the ostracized, the poor, and the needy in your society. It's impossible to be rightly related with God without being rightly related to man. And injustice and its ever form will shout at us when we see it because we know God. Now, notice if you will where it mentions several things. When it says swift witness, this is the idea of an expert and being expert means he is rapid at his task because he's an expert. That's what it means. 
Now, of course, sorcerers are those who are connected with witchcraft and try to manipulate powers, supernatural powers for their own purposes. Then we have adulterers. Now, many have thought because of the emphasis in chapter 2, verse 16 on mixed marriages that this adulterers may be an illusion of these mixed marriages. We're not sure. Swearing falsely is the taking your brother to court and lying. Uh, oppress the wage owner. Now, I want to tell you, about the Bible rails against the uh, landowner exploiting uh, the daily uh, laborer. Listen to this. Uh, Leviticus 19:13, Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, and James 5, 4 all deal with this idea of exploiting the wage owner. And then we have the widow, Exodus 22, 22 through 24. Boy, the, Deut- the book of Deuteronomy just hits over and over that God is for the widow and for the orphan and for the, uh, the uh, resident alien. Um, and he's mentioned here a little later on. Then it says, turn aside the alien, Deuteronomy 24, verses 14, and then 19 through 22, and then 27, 19. And do not fear me. You see, the way these people were dealing with problems in their society reflected the way they dealt with God. You mean tell me that how I deal with poor people, how I deal with the underprivileged, how I deal with those who are facing injustice, that I'm really dealing with God? Well, that, isn't that exactly what Jesus was saying in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where he says, when you give a cup of cold water in my name, you're giving it to me. When you help the least of these, you're helping me. Well, that's the idea. When we minister to others because we know God, in God's name, we're doing it as unto him. Now, the Proverbs has many passages to help the poor is to give unto the Lord. And that's the idea here. Now, verse 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Well, this is used in three different senses, and maybe all of them should be combined. One is God's character that does not change. One is God's faithfulness that does not change. And the third is God's purpose that does not change. Now, there is an overarching will of God and an individual will. The overarching will cannot be affected. The individual will, we have a chance to say yes or no. But the overarching, we cannot affect. Now, this is the idea of the changelessness of God. Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Psalms 102, 27, uh, James 1, 17, and Revelation 13, 8. The changelessness of God. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob. Now, the word Jacob means cheat or surplanter. It seems to be a play here on the changelessness of God and the changingness of Israel the faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of Israel because that's what the end means, are too consumed. So we're we're contrasting the God and the people. Now this is where the confusion comes in on the conditional and unconditional covenants. God's covenant is always unconditional. But it is conditioned on man's response. And every generation and every individual has a chance to respond to the unconditional covenant of God. Whoever will, God will. Now, there's where the paradox comes, the dialectical tension. Is it conditional or unconditional? Yes, it is. Now, notice if you would where it mentions here, from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. And here's the emphasis on the rebellion of the nation of Israel. Return to me and I will return to you. Now, this is not dealing with initial repentance. This is continual repentance. And I think just as initial faith is important and lifestyle faith is important, I think initial repentance is important and ongoing repentance. Isn't that what 1 John 1, 9 is all about? That's written to Christians. That's not talking about salvation. Now, Mark 1, 15 says repent and believe, and there are both of them. But we must continue to repent and believe. So John 1, 9 is a verse for Christians to confess their sins so the relationship won't be broken. And that's the basis of of the destruction that occurs in Christians. Jesus has died for all sin, but it breaks the relationship, the joy, the communication between God and man. And so we need to confess it ongoing. And that's what the ideal here is. Now, you might want to see Zechariah 1, 3 and James 4, 8. Uh, Now, here's the question they ask. But you say, how shall we return? Now, there seem to be two aspects of this. One, maybe they're really asking, how can we get back to God? Tell us what we need to do. Or maybe they're thinking, we haven't done anything that we need to repent of. We haven't done anything we need to get back to God with. Now, one of those is true. And from the text, it's, it's very hard to know which. Now, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed God, thee? In tithes and contributions. Now, what the, what the prophet did is take one example of many he could have taken. So he picked the area of giving to show how they had uh, 
cheated God, how they had robbed God, how they were not acting faithfully. Earlier he had talked about how they weren't offering the proper sacrifices. Now he's going to talk about how the people aren't uh, really giving the way God commanded in the Old Testament. Now the question always comes up about tithing here. And many uh, New Testament preachers preach this verse of their church on tithing. I have a note here and I want to read you two books on tithing quickly. This is my note. Tithing is not an exegetical New Testament truth, but an implied truth by analogy. The New Testament speaks more of sacrificial, joyful, regular, proportional giving, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, than it does percentage giving, but the attitude is the key, and those under grace should do greater than those under law. Now, the tithe came before the law. You might want to see Genesis 14, 20, Genesis 28, 22. But basically, it was the income tax for the uh, theocratic kingdom to support the Levites and the priest and to help the poor. There was not one tithe. There were three tithes spread in cycles. Now, uh, a couple of my favorite books. This is uh, New Testament Theology by Frank Stagg, and I want to read you a brief pit, a bit here where he quotes Paul Stagg about tithing. I'm on page 293. While much be said for adopting the tithe voluntarily as a standard for one's giving without rigidly imposing it upon others as a Christian requirement, it is clear in adopting such a practice that one is not carrying on an Old Testament practice. At most, one is doing something only remotely analogous to the tithing practice of the Old Testament, which was a tax to support the temple and the priestly system, a social and religious system which no longer exists. Tithes were obligatory in Judaism as a tax until the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, but they are thus not binding upon Christians. Now, I think that's very true. We make too much of a legalistic thing instead of a joyful thing. Now, this is one of my favorite books on the Old Testament, The Authority of the Old Testament by John Bright. Listen to this. But even as regards laws that are obviously ceremonial in character, we are not always clear. No Christian, to be sure, would suggest that we return to animal sacrifice or to dietary laws of Judaism. But what about tithing? Church boards recommend it, and many Christians have adopted the tithe as an ideal by which to measure their giving. Indeed, there are those who look upon the tithe as not a goal or an ideal, but a binding obligation, and confidently expect, for so their pastors have assured them, uh, basing himself, no doubt, on Malachi 3, 6 through 3, 12, that if only they were faithful in this regard, their financial affairs will prosper. I once knew such a man well and shall never forget his agonized perplexity when he lost everything that he had. That is to say that there are Christians who regard the law of the tithe, probably in the form in which it is recorded in Leviticus 27, 30 through 33, as in some way normative, a thing uh, would never dream of doing in the case, say, of the laws regarding the clean and unclean, ritual purification and the like also found in Leviticus. No criticism of tithers is intended, but rather praise of their good stewardship. But why is one ritual regulation regarded as having normative authority and not others? Now that's a good question, folks. I do not believe the tithe is a New Testament principle. Now the way you should find out is to look up the word tithing in your concordance, see how it's used in the New Testament, see if it's something Jesus teaches. Now Jesus mentions it for Pharisees and says they keep the, the little nitpicking things but miss the weightier matters of the law. Now, I believe the tithe is not a floor for New Testament Christians, uh, not a ceiling for us to look up to, but a floor for us to walk on. Until we're giving far beyond that, we don't have the joy of giving. I think every Christian ought to give far more than that because of the grace of God in their lives. Now, notice if you would with me the word contributions. Now, this is the priest part of the sacrifice, the part of the animal they got for uh, offering the rest on the, sac on the sacrificial altar. Now, you might want to see Exodus 29, 27, and 28, Leviticus 7, 32, and Numbers 5, 10. Okay? Now, that's where it says, you are cursed with a curse. Now, you look at uh, Proverbs 11, 24, and especially Deuteronomy 27 and 28, which is the cursing and blessing chapter in the book of Deuteronomy, where the Levitical priest would get up on the mountains where Shechem in the valley, Mount Ebal, Mount Gezerim. One would shout the blessings if we keep the covenant. One would shout the cursings if we don't. And friends, I want to tell you, those things were literally fulfilled in the life of Israel. And they're talking about that right here, the cursings and blessings. Now, notice where it says, uh, verse 10, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse. Now, I know many people who preach this, the storehouse being the local New Testament church. I was reading one of my favorite authors the other day, 
F.F. Uh, F. Bruce on his book uh, Answers to Biblical Questions, and he was asserting that American Christians do that, but that English Christians don't. I don't think we can say that this is definitely teaching that all, the, that first of all, that God demands a tithe from Christians, and that that means every bit of it must be given to the local church. That's going far beyond the text for, a, for what we want to do. And we need to be careful of that, even if it's in an area like this. Uh, we need to be careful of reading what we want out of the book and then demanding our followers to say, do it or you're out of the will of God. Hmm, that's a bit strong. Notice where it says, test me in verse 10. Uh, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing on you. There's no more room, no more need. Now, this obviously refers to agricultural blessing in verse 10 and 11. But I think it's, a, it, it's speaking about the spiritual contentment and need that God's going to provide his people. Now, notice here something very, very important. Compare verse 10 with verse 14. The same Hebrew word appears in both, a testing of metals. Now, in one, it's appropriate. God says, give, and I'll bless you. And the other God says, why are you testing me, you wicked thing? So it, it's not the test that's the problem. It is the attitude of the heart, the one that does it to try God, trust him, to see if he's really there, will reap destruction from it. But the one who wants to stand on the promises of God, prove his faithfulness. Oh, friends, hey, God's going to bless that person. Now, let me go back and say this. I've heard enough preaching on this to say, if you give uh, a dollar, God will give you $10. That is never the motive of New Testament giving. We give out of tremendous joy in being a part of the kingdom of God, and then based on the definitive New Testament passage on giving, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, God will give more and more to the person who gives more and more. Now, he's not going to give us more for our personal pleasure. He's going to give us more because he's found a faithful steward who will channel his resources to the places he wants them. This old deal about, well, I'm going to give 10% to God and then 90% belongs to me. I assert to you that 100% of all that we are, all that we have, all that we can be, belongs to God. And we are stewards, not owners of everything, including our own lives and our families and our children and our ministries and our, our pocketbooks and everything. I think we need to rethink through this tithing deal uh, base. And this is a book on the authority of the Old Testament by John Bright. If the Old Testament is not understandable to you, this is the best book on how to interpret the Old Testament I've ever seen. The Authority of the Old Testament by John Bright, Abingdon Press. I tell you, it really helped me to see the, how we so often force the Old Testament into the new or we somehow let the laws of Israel sneak into the church like the tithe and then try to make them mandatory. Now, this pour out a blessing on you, God's going to bless those who give with a good heart. I know that. So they can give more to the kingdom of God. Now, verse 11. Then I will rebuke the devourer. Now, this may be another name for the locusts uh, for you. So that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes. This is a Hebrew word for a miscarriage, a very strong term. Okay? Says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Here, what God does for Israel is a witness to all the other nations. Now, I, I have real problems sometimes with what modern Zionism does, but I, I believe this. I believe God is going to keep his hand involved in the nation of Israel to prove to other nations, prove to other nations who he is and what he's about in our world. Now, that's, God is going to act not because of their fa uh, faithfulness, but because of the loyalty to his own promise. Now, friends, that's the kind of God I can trust. In any situation, I know, even when I blow it so badly, that he's going to come through because of who he is, not because who I am. And that makes all the difference in every area of the Christian life. Because of who he is, not because of who I am. Now, you might want to see Ezekiel 36, 22 and 23, where this very same truth is mentioned. Um, I hope you'll think through that deal on tithing. It's a hard subject for us, but it is a good example of how we treat the Bible. Now, some of us are, we tend to be very legalistic. Uh, 
instead of being relationship oriented out of love and gratitude, we tend to try to kind of work our way to God's acceptance. There's a real problem there. God does not love us because of the abundance of rules that we keep or don't keep. God loves us because of his son. And because we're loved, we're going to do certain things in his name. Because we're loved, we're going to respond to others in need. Not so God love us, verse 5, but because we're Christians, because we're related to God, because we have God's heart and God's mind and God's focus, we're going to help. Now that's the whole difference between being a son and being a slave. Between being a part of God's family and functioning out of gratitude and feeling like somehow you have to work your way to God and have to keep working to stay there. The difference in these two things, the difference between great joy in Christianity and great misery. Now Malachi, in his day, is saying, you folks aren't doing what you know is appropriate. Now there are some New Testament passages that we go to and say, in our day, Jesus is saying, are you loving one another? Are you giving account of the hope that's in you? Uh, are you, you know, rightly related to your fellow man? Are you praying for one another? Are you witnessing? Are you giving joyfully? Uh, there are many things in the church that, are, that have this same idea. But this is ancient Israel. And we can't base a New Testament giving program on this ancient pattern without doing violence. And I will tell you again, I think Christians ought to go far, 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 far beyond this and you'll find great joy oh man don't give till it hurt give till it giggles i've enjoyed being with you and i'll see you again same time same place next week